Hey everybody, welcome to the Linux Cast. I'm your host, Matthew Weber. And I'm running solo once again this week. I'm pretty sure that's going to be the norm for a while. So, this week, we're going to be talking about the AUR and why I'm such a fanboy. But first, sorry about that, moving the mic. I'm going to be moving the contact info to the top of the show. If you want to get in contact with us, you can do so. Uh, at the Linux Cast on Twitter, I'm at MTWB on Twitter. You can also email us now. I've got a brand new fancy email address, the Linuxcast at gmail.com. It's just so much easier to use Gmail. Uh, maybe someday I'll use Proton or something. You can also follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash the Linuxcast, and you can subscribe to our feeds everywhere. But it might be easier just to go to the Linuxcast.org, which points you to our anchor page. So, let's jump right into our topic for tonight. The AUR, the Arch User Repository, sometimes called the Arch Community User Repository, is, um, let's first ask the question, what is the AUR? So, if you don't use Arch, you're probably wondering, why do all the Arch users continue to talk about the AUR like it's the best thing since sliced bread? Well, there's a good reason for that, and we're going to be talking about that tonight today, whatever time period you're in. I'm recording this at almost 1 o'clock in the morning. So so what is the AUR? The AUR is a community-sponsored collection of programs. The keyword here is community. As this is a community put together, as, as, as this is a collection put together by a community and not by Arch Linux itself, uh, it means that it's um, not supported by Arch itself. So we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, let me talk about the downsides. So basically, it's it's very simple. Just like with Ubuntu, Ubuntu has its own Ubuntu repository that's supported and maintained by Canonical. And then it has a uh, tons of little PPAs or whatever that um, are supported by the community. They're all separate and in different places and they're not up to date and all this, you know, crappy stuff that has to do with PPAs. The Arch does it, di uh, the AUR does it differently where the community puts their packages in this one single repository. While it's not supported by Arch Linux, it's supported by the community. And that means you go to this one place for your software. So one of the things, so People ask me a lot, why do you love the AUR? So, why is the uh, why is the AUR different than other repositories, and why is it better? Uh, we really don't already talk about this. It's really simple. I'm not even sure how we can make it a whole episode of this because it, it just seems quite obvious that the AUR is superior to everything else. Um, all the software you need is in one place. So, if you need uh, Audacity, it's there. I mean, Audacity is in the regular Arch uh, repository as well, but it's you know in the AUR as well. Could I say as well another time? I think I probably could. <laughs> um, so, like I said, there it, all the all the software that you can imagine is there. If there's a software package that you need, it's probably in the AUR. So even things like one of the problems we have with elementary OS is that they ha they foster programs that are specifically designed for the their own version of Linux. And most often these things can only be found in their app store or through the ability to build and compile the programs yourself. And that can be a whole other episode, but usually the exception to those things is in the AUR because people will go through and build those programs or put the binaries in the AUR and then allow you to build them easily through a AUR helper like yay or something. And it, it also allows you to do like a lot of people like the elementary OS uh, desktop environment. I think it's called Pantheon. That's in the AUR. It's, it's pretty hard to do that if you can on Ubuntu because you'd have to go through and compile it yourself if it's even possible. But because the AUR has this single place where people can put those binaries and it's easy for users to build them. It allows 
those complex programs that aren't necessarily always available for other Linux distributions to be in the AUR. So it, the true strength of the Arch user repository is its size and the community. Because it's community maintained and it's fairly easy to package a program for the AUR, it allows the breadth of programs to be huge I'm gonna huge mungus, you know, because that's a word. Um, very large. Um, and it, it allows users to go to that one place and it's very convenient. Now, we talked a lot last week about snaps and this is basically what snaps and Flatpak is trying to do. Create one place, one repository for all your software needs and make it easy to browse and find new software, new apps and things like that. The AUR isn't necessarily the same thing. And I'm gonna I say this, it, it, while it is similar in that it's a single place where there's a whole bunch of applications that you can find and uh, they're packaged in a certain way and they can be downloaded in a certain way and they're maintained in a certain way, like snaps. The AUR is not necessarily the place. The AUR is not as good at discoverability as snaps are because snaps has the snap store and flatpak has flathub the aur has pamac it is kind of uh, the only thing that's really comparable um now i mean there is a website for the aur that has all their packages listed but it's not it's just a list of packages right you can search through it but it's not like there's not featured featured categories and all that stuff now like I said, there is PAMAC, which is the the GUI version of PacMac, Pacman, um, that comes packaged with quite a few Arch-based distros, or you can you, obviously you can download it, um, but it's not the same experience that you have on like Snaps or you know the Snap Store, or the FlatHub, where those are curated stores that allow you, uh, the maintainers to feature different applications uh, put things in categories and and uh, sort them in certain ways put popularity things and reviews and all that stuff that's just not kind of really what the AUR is for because it's just not the way it was built uh, it's, I mean that's one I suppose we could talk about that in the downside section as well is that there's not that ability to curate curate and find the best most popular applications you kind of have to find them yourself um but we're not to the downside yet so because it's put together by the community and support it's supported by the entire community community meaning that there is no fragmentation of control like there is with our pa other package management systems so uh snaps versus flat packs flat packs versus snaps uh you know apt versus pacman uh, you know or even within the ubuntu you know environment uh, ecosystem was the word i was looking for there even amongst that ecosystem you ha you have competing package management uh systems you have you know you have snaps you have apt you, you know you have to understand how uh you know like um De um, Debian packages work, so you can install things through that. You can install packages in multiple different ways, and you can do that on Arch as well. But usually, just when you need a package, you use an AUR helper and download it from the AUR or download it from the Arch repositories. It's that one single way of installing your applications, other than having four or five different ways of doing it, and several of those having security security flaws that are not going to ever be fixed ppas we're looking at you um all software that comes from the aur is updated through the aur, AUR. so this is a, a huge benefit because it, it happens on other distros as well but because it's you downloaded it all from one place all the updates and uh, change logs and stuff like that can be found through the aur Whereas on other ones, it updates through the system, but
but the system has to kind of plug into wherever it came from. So you're like with Ubuntu, you add repositories for your PPAs, and while it keeps your software up to date, you have to have this long list of repositories or you know PPAs that you know you've subscribed to so that you can get your updates. Whereas with Arch, it's just the Arch repository and the AUR. It's that that's it. Um, and while that's not a huge advantage, because most of the mostly on Ubuntu, it's you know seamless. It can be. It's just it's the idea of simplicity, right? So another I mean, we just talked about simplicity, which is weird because it gets more complex on how you install. So let's talk about this for a little while. There is a while there's just one AUR, there are many ways to interact with the AUR. You can use you can build the packages yourself after downloading downloading them. You can use one of the many different AUR helpers like Yay, Pack AUR, um, Yaourt is is no longer maintained, but people still use it. There's I mean there's dozens and dozens of different HUR helpers, and that's both good and bad. It's good because you have choices based on how you want to interact with the AUR. I personally use Yay. I think most people should use Yay, but it's not the simplest way of dealing with AUR. I think that's pack AUR. Um, but because there's these different choices, you know, you can choose what you want. Now, the downside is obviously that choice, choice, Added choices means more complexity and harder to choose what you want to do. So for new users of the AUR, you may not know which uh, AUR helper to use. Or, I mean, chances are your system probably comes with Yay installed, or maybe you want to switch. Or it's, it just adds a level of complexity that the new users are going to have to, you know, get into and learn and things like that. And that's one of the things that can kind of turn people away from using uh, different things on Linux. I mean, it's one of the things that turns people away from using Linux, right? So it, people don't necessarily want to engage their brains, if you will, and learn new things. And adding a whole bunch of different AURs can add that complexity that is not is both good and bad. So... Let's jump into the downsides. The number one thing you'll hear when people talk about the downsides of the AUR is security concerns. And that's because anybody, good or bad, can upload to the AUR and there's no central figure. There's no commun community committee or uh, overhead or oversight of the AUR. Um, so basically, when you download something, you're doing it at your own risk. It's um, very much like Windows <laughs> and P I, I, and PPAs, really, in, in that sense, because when you download something via PPA in Ubuntu, you're downloading it from Joe Schmo on the internet. You have no idea if that's actually legitimate software or if it, you're downloading, you know, uh, uh, mal malware of some kind or ransomware or whatever so it's one of those things that you're, people talk about how oh if you download something from the AUR you're taking your computer into your own the life of your computer into your own hands and like oh mostly that is FUD I think because you have that same kind of uh, risk with every package management systems outside of snap and flatpak because snap and flatpak are maintained by a central figure you know central group of you know maintainers and they review them for malware and things like that where but every other package management system has the same risks that the AUR does only it those package management systems don't have the advantages so PPAs, for example, I know I, I pick on PPAs a lot because PPAs are tor terrible. And I'm going to talk about why I hate PPAs in a little while. Actually, I'll just talk about it now. Uh, you know, you, you need a piece of software. You're using Ubuntu, the latest LTS. And, you know, Ubuntu is awesome. You know, I'm, I'm an Arch user, but 
for the most part, Ubuntu is fantastic software, and it's it's a good distribution. You can use it; it's very stable. But prior to the Snap Store, PPAs were the predominant way of getting pa you know packages and applications. And you know, unless you wanted to deal with dev files and things like that, and even though you know dev file a lot, of, most, a lot of times dev files came from PPAs. So my experiences were. I need an application, so I have to go to this certain website and subscribe to a PPA, update the um, system to recognize that the PPA is now part of the subscription, and then install the package that I want, hoping that not only was the package up to date, but that the package was actually there half the time that the package you know, was either broken or wasn't there even though it was advertised to be there. And it was just a really bad experience. PPAs remind me a lot of how Windows used to do software. On Windows prior to the Windows Store, which nobody still uses the Windows Store, so they really are still in this situation. If you need a piece of software, you go to the vendor, you download a .dxe file or a wizard, and it installs the program for you. And you do that for every single piece of software that you need. That's annoying as fuck. It really, really is. I don't want to have to go to several different places to get all my software, and that's, that just really annoyed me. When I first started using Ubuntu, it was before Snaps were here, or more, I think it was more before Snaps became any good at all. And I had to go to these separate different things. I had like, you know, t three dozen PPAs, and I had to, you know, I had to do that every single time I installed Ubuntu, and it was just annoying as fuck, and I didn't want to do it anymore. And that's why I fell in love with the AUR. Because all the programs I need, right there, you know, through either using Pac-Man or Pamac or Yay or whatever. And it was fantastic. It was, it's just something that I've never wanted to go away from. So, who would, so this is a question I, I, I ask. Who would benefit the most from using Day You Are? And... I don't think it's hyperbole to say that everyone would benefit if we switched to the AUR. We talked a little bit last week about how fragmentation is a big problem in the Linux, you know, you know, community, and how you know, well, choice is good. It can also cause massive confusion amongst new users. And why I don't think I don't I I don't think or suggest that everyone. Should every distro should switch to the AUR. If I was in charge, that would happen. But it's probably a good thing that I'm not in charge. So, um, but theoretically, everyone would benefit if at all the distros used the AUR. The, uh, the, it could replace snaps, flat packs, PPAs, and everything. And moreover, if it was the predominant way of installing applications on Linux as a whole, the entire Linux community would support it and contribute to it, and it would be even better than it is now. That's one of the reasons why the AUR is so good is because it has a massive community of developers developing for it, and it allows you know the ease of use of having one central place of finding your software. Another group that would benefit from using the AUR mo the, the most is probably developers. Um, when you're a developer writing your your application is really only one you know it may be the biggest hurdle but it's not it's not the only hurdle that you have to jump through especially on linux like uh, if you're on windows you just create an exe file and it works on every windows machine or you know every windows 10 machine or whatever the only uh dependency it may have is what op what version of windows right on Linux, because there's so many different distributions, you have to package your package in, you know, for apt. You have to package it for snap. You have to package it for Flatpak. You have to package it for the AUR. You have to package it for, you know, Fedora and OpenSUSE and all these different distributions. And no, you know, that's not that's not a good experience as a developer. You want to be able to package it just once and allow it to be used on every distribution that runs Linux. And, well, that's the, 
ideal behind snaps, it can, it's also the ideal behind the AUR. You just package it for the AUR and it could be available to everyone. And you wouldn't have, and because it's community developed and community sponsored, you don't have the control and iron fist of canonical behind it that, you know, people worry about with snaps. So, um, I didn't skip a couple things with the downsides. I'm going to go back to that actually. Um, sometimes reading is really hard. I have these notes. I don't always follow the notes. <laughs> and that's not a good thing for uh, my organizational skills. Um, which, by the way, organizational skills, non existent. <laughs> like, like, really, non existent. Okay, so, uh, down, going back to the downsides just a little bit. Um, so it can be difficult for new uh, users of Linux to actually understand what the AUR does. So um, unlike different other repositories, the AUR is unpackaged binaries that the users actually build themselves. So that's what AUR helpers actually do is they go through and take these package builds of things that, you know, list the dependencies and and files for the program and then they go through and basically run make install and compile the program but it's all done through automated automated um scripts controlled by the aur helper like yay or whatever um, and well for the most part that stuff happens in the background there are certain steps that you see happen especially if you use this through the terminal that um new users wouldn't necessarily uh, understand or be able to comprehend or get through they'd have to look it up and actually learn it so that's one uh, uh, more downside for the AUR and the other one is similar in that there are so many AUR helpers um, that you have to you know choose which one you want to use and then you say so you do choose say like yay uh, it's it's not the yeah it's not sudo apt install and then just hit yes. Sometimes you have to say, it asks you, do you want to read the package build? Do you want to install, you know, this version or this version of a dependency? Do you want to uh, remove, uh, make, make dependencies after installation? Certain things like that. And those are those little steps that you have to use when using yay add extra complexity that are not necessarily new user friendly so that's a downside so I know I kind of skipped back and forth between sections there that's because like I said reading is hard so okay just a couple more sections here why um so if you've listened to the podcast for any number of you know episodes you'll know that I'm a huge I mean <laughs> I don't know you could listen to this podcast, this episode here, and discover that I'm a really big fan of the AUR. I'm a fanboy, and I will, I live and die by the AUR, and I think it's going to be something that always is the case. I have a really hard time going back to different distros like Ubuntu or OpenSUSE. I mean, I really like OpenSUSE. I like the team behind OpenSUSE. I think they're very creative people, and I think that of all the all the distros open susa does the best job of marketing because they do these really cool music videos <laughs> that um nobody really knows about but they're really awesome but leaving arch is really hard because the aur is there i mean i don't want once i get a system set up i don't download a lot of software maybe one program you know a month or two or whatever but it's nice to know that it's there and it's i don't have to go hunting and searching for uh, you know what website or vendor or whatever is supplying the software that I'm looking for. So it's really hard for me to leave Arch because of the AUR. Really, that's the only. Re I mean, people ask why. Hey, why do you use Arch-based distros? And really, the only reason I use the Arch-based distros is because of the AUR. It's the only reason. Otherwise, Arch is basically just a Linux system. It's basically Ubuntu. Um, you know, it's but harder to install you know so so it um if, if the aur and arch you know or the aur didn't exist there would be no reason for me to use arch i just use ubuntu and use snaps or something
but thank God the AUR exists because the wor world without it would be so much worse. It just... I have this written down here. Going back to, and finding software on Ubuntu feels like going back to the 1990s. And while that situation is, is changing because of snaps, there's a lot of things that aren't you know put in snaps. And there's a lot of reasons why you wouldn't want to use snaps. You know, becoming reliant on a single package management system that's controlled by Ubuntu itself is a little scary to me. Uh, I, I envision, if you listen to my other podcast with my friends Ricky and Vince, we uh, do predictions every year, and one of the predictions for the last two years is that a Canonical is going to get bought by Microsoft. Now, I don't know if this is actually going to ever happen, but Microsoft has become very interested in open source lately, and it wouldn't surprise me at some point if they throw $50 billion at Canonical and say, hey, we really like, you know, we now own Ubuntu, and we own the Snap Store. What happens then? I mean, people freak the fuck out when Microsoft bought Git, and I, I mean, it, it, it'd be a nightmare for everybody who hates Microsoft. I mean, I don't think it'd be the end of Ubuntu or end of the snaps, but it, it's not necessarily something that I'd want to participate in. Now I know, like I said, that's a, a, a what if scenario, but it, it worries me to be reliant on that one package management system that might get gobbled up by a big tech giant. Arch is never going to get s s purchased by a big tech giant. It's just not because it doesn't have a presence in the cloud or whatever. It has no money-making capabilities. Uh, it's just, you know, it's it's for the community, made by the community, and it, it's good that way. So it doesn't have, for me, it doesn't have those worries. And so, I mean, it's just me being paranoid, I know, but I can, you know, I can't really help that. So, in conclusion, I'm going to try... The last couple times with these big topics, I've uh, emitted a, a conclusion section. And uh, I'm going to try to put those in to these episodes from now on. The AUR is great. I, I, I mean, there's it's just it's so good. It's so nice to be able to just open up a terminal. A, ter, a, ter, a terminal? 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 Ter, good lord. I told you I was re recording this at 1.30 in the morning. Words are hard, my friends. Terminal. My vocabulary is terminal. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, my, my word vomit has made me lose my train of thought. It, it's so nice to be able to go to a terminal, hard word, uh, and just, you know, yay, dash, at, capital S, you know, whatever, and you know, it installs. It's so nice not to have to go hunting and searching for something on, you know, the Snapster or whatever, or, you know, God forbid, PPAs. So, the AUR is great. Now, I brought up the scenario of who will be would benefit from using the AUR, and the whole crazy scenario of every distro using the AUR. That's never going to happen. Because, first of all, Snaps and flat packs do exist, and Snaps and flat, flat packs definitely do have advantages over the AUR, specifically the stores that they're curated in. Um, and uh, those stores are something that the AUR doesn't have and never is going to have because it's not ran by a central committee or a group of people. It's ran by a, an entire community. So, I put that out there, but it's never going to happen. And I think that's probably a good thing. So, as much as I love the AUR, and I suggest everyone use it, I suggest everyone get on an Arch-based distro and use the AUR, you'll never, ever go back, probably. But, it's good that there are other ways of doing things in Linux. It's one of the things that makes Linux great to go, you know, you don't like the way, you know, the AUR works, go use Ubuntu. You don't like the way the Ubuntu works, go to OpenSUSE or Arch or whatever. You know, just, it, it, that's what makes Linux so good is that there's choice. I mean, obviously choice, we talked about choice having, add, making added complexity to the ecosystem and making it harder for users to choose and things like that. But for the most part, choice is good. 
and I think that that is something that uh, would be taken away if everyone used the AUR. So I think everyone should use <laughs> AUR, but um, use what works for you the best, and uh, at least try. You know what? I have a challenge for you. Go if you've only ever used Ubuntu. Say you're a new user, which is mostly the people. Uh, who I expect to listen to this podcast is because this is for noobs. Um, but if you've never used an Arch based twister, go install one. Um, Arch isn't scary to install because there are alternatives that are based off Arch. So install Manjaro, install install Arco or whatever Arctic, any of these, and give it a, give them a try. Try the AUR, see what I'm talking about, and um, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. And at least then you can see why I'm such a fanboy. Because you, maybe you can see the advantages to it. So that is it for this episode. I made it a full 30 minutes, which is pretty impressive for, you know, not having anything to say other than the AUR is great, the AUR is great, the AUR is great. You know, I, I got my pom-poms and if I didn't have bad knees, I'd be jumping up and saying the AUR is great. I'd have a dance and everything, but... They're just going to have to put up with this. This is my uh, ode to the, A the AUR. So, just in case you missed it at the beginning, contact info. You can follow the LinuxCast at the LinuxCast on Twitter. You can follow me, I'm at MTWB on Twitter. You can follow. You can email us at the LinuxCast at gmail.com. You can follow us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash the LinuxCast. We are available on every podcast catcher that you can imagine. But they're all pretty much listed at the linuxcast.org, which points to our anchor.fm page. Now, like I've said in the last few episodes, I am looking for a co-host because this is so much easier if I have someone to talk to. I think I've gotten a little better at doing these things solo. I don't say um a lot, but I still say quite a, you know, um quite a bit. And it's so much easier if I'm not sitting here talking to myself and staring at audacity like a loser. So... If you're interested in becoming a co-host for the Linux Cast, even if it's just occasionally, there is no money involved, obviously, but you know, a volunteer would be nice. Um, come talk with me. Come have a chat. That'd be nice. Anyways, uh, if you want to do that, just uh, uh, PM me on Twitter or give me an email or whatever. It doesn't matter. And uh, our topic for next week is going to be a good one. We're going to talk about Windows. <laughs> yes. You know, Windows, Microsoft Windows, that... Uh, legacy ridden beast of uh, operating system that dominates the world um but and specifically we're going to be talking about the windows socket layer for linux i think is it called or windows something or the other it's wsl i don't even know what it is um i'm going to do some research before then obviously know what the hell it stands for before then uh, I just want to know if it's good or bad for Linux because I've never actually used it. I might even, I have a, a Windows installed that I never use. I might install it, find out what the hell it is. Anyways, we'll see you next week.